That's good. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Hebrews with me this morning, please. Chapter number 9. Hebrews 9. If you'd like to stand as we open the pages of the infallible book. Hebrews chapter number 9. And verse number 27. The book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. The scripture says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Father, bless your word now. And I pray you'd use me this morning, Heavenly Father, to preach it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. The scripture is very clear about something that you should know by now. It is appointed to men once to die. There's a lot of things in life that are uncertain. There's certainly a lot of things that are uncertain. We make plans about a lot of things and they don't work out the way you planned them. They certainly don't. You anticipate certain things to happen. They don't happen the way you anticipate them. Sometimes experience can, in the past can prove to be wrong in the future. It doesn't happen the way you thought it was going to happen. But there's one thing you can be certain of this morning. You can be absolutely and completely certain of this, that you're going to die. That is the most certain thing that a human being can know. And I want to emphasize that point to you this morning. It is absolutely, completely certain that you're going to die. If the Lord Jesus Christ comes back soon, then we will not go the way of all the earth, as David said, but we will go up with him. We'll leave this body behind. That's why it's called the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior because it's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if that doesn't happen, you're going to die. I remember years ago when I had a shop down here on Broadway. I was a professional mechanic before I came to the church. And I had a shop called Foreign Cars Unlimited. That was 37 years ago. I had a lady come in one time. I was doing something I'd break jobs something for. I don't know what it was. But I started talking to her about her soul. I don't know if she expected to get that when she went to the mechanic shop, but I started talking to her about her soul. I don't know how many people I ran off like that. Who, who knows? But I started talking to her about her soul. She talked to me for a little while, and then she said, I don't talk anymore about this. She said, this is too heavy. This is too heavy. I don't want to think about this. And I thought that's quite a revealing thing. She didn't want to think about it. It was too uncomfortable for her. It's uncomfortable to think that there was going to come a day when her life is going to end. A lot of people have the idea that the, that the earth, that life is just one big party. 24-7, that's what you're here for. You're here to party. You're here to have a big time. And then when, it, when life's over, then you lay down in bed and gather your feet up and pull the covers up over you and say, well, goodbye world, it's over now, see you later, and that's it. But it doesn't happen that way. Life is not like that. You don't know how you're going to come down to your end. You may get sick and languish for a long time, but you may walk out that back door and drop in that parking lot. You may pull out here on Woodrow Drive and something happens, some mishap. So anything can happen. We don't know. It is uncertain at how it's going to happen, but there's one thing for certain, you're going to die. And the absolute most certain thing on the face of this earth is the fact that you will come to the end of your life and it is the very thing that very few people make any provision for whatsoever. There's an insanity. There is some kind of a brain disconnect going on. There, there has to be some kind of a mad thing happening in the minds of people when the thing that is absolutely certain, they make no provision for whatsoever. You make provision for retirement, lay up money for years and and but invest in the stock market and 401ks and all this and get ready for your retirement because you look forward to the golden years as you call them. They're not so golden really. Sometimes they're not as golden as you think. You, you discover a lot of pains and aches you didn't know you had. But the truth of the matter is uh, a lot of you don't reach retirement. You make plans for it. You really do. I mean, you've worked for 30, 40 years for some company and all that. And, and then the day of your retirement, you drop dead. You drop dead. You see, retirement is not absolute. It's not certain. It is not certain that you'll ever retire. It's not. 
It is not. It is not certain that you'll retire. But it is certain that you'll die. It is absolutely, completely certain that the day is going to come when your life is going to end on this earth. Have you made preparation? Have you made preparation? Have you prepared yourself for that day? For it is coming. It is coming. And there's not one thing you can do to stop it. That day is coming. Are you ready? You say, well now, preacher, I just don't want to think about it. Not thinking about it is not going to change anything. Denying it is not going to change it. Saying it's not going to happen except for some long time off into the future. That's not so. Teenagers die. Young people die. Kids die. People die in their midlife. They die at all ages. Death is no respecter of age. And that's one that's absolutely certain that you're going to die. The Bible said it's appointed to men once to die. And then the judgment. Notice how the Bible concludes or continues on with the fact that even though that life leaves the body, it's not over. It's really just the beginning. It's just the beginning. So the Bible said it's appointed to men once to die. I ask you again. I'm going to ask you a pointed, simple question. Have you made provision? Are you ready? If you're not ready to die, you're not ready to live. You don't know anything about life until you realize where you're headed when the life leaves this body. Are you ready to die? Now you didn't create death and death didn't come upon you because of something you did. Death was here before you ever showed up. Death is the, death is the result of man's rebellion against God. When he sinned, he brought death into this world. And death by sin. So death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Death is the consummation of rebellion and sin against God. It's here. It's a fact. It's something we deal with. And so my friend this morning, one more time, I want to ask you a question. Have you made provision for death, are you ready? I'm not talking about your funeral. I'm not talking about if you bought you a plot and ground out here. I'm not talking about how much money you've got laid up and then you've told people what you want them to say, who's going to sing at your funeral and where they're going to do it and this and that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the moment that your soul and spirit leaves this body and you breathe no more and you have no control over it and you leave planet earth and you are going to leave this world. Are you ready for that day? If you've ever been up to the door of death and felt its wing, it's felt its cold, icy chill on your soul, then you're different from most people. Some people on this earth have been there. They've seen it. They understand what it's about. They know how it feels. And it changes them for the rest of their lives. Take note of that. You ought to watch somebody that's been there. You ought, to, you ought to listen to them. You ought to listen to what they've got to say because they have something to say that you need to hear. Sin and Satan will keep you in this la-la land where you think that you're just going to live forever and you can just live any way you please and life is just one big sinning party and then when you get ready somewhere way off in the future, then you're just going to leave out of a big party. My friend, you're going to die. You're going to die. It's appointed to men wants to die. Death is coming. Some of you, it's closer than you think. Some of you may be dead before the year's out. Some of you may be dead before the week's out. Some of you may be dead before the sun goes down. You do not know when it's coming. But I want to warn you again. Death is coming. It is certain. It is sure. It is the most certain thing there is on the face of this earth. The government can't change it. Education can't change it. Money can't change it. Associations can't change it. Your religion can't change it. Nothing can alter the fact that you're going to die. Are you ready? Oh, no, I'm not ready, preacher. We've got step number one taken care of. If you will admit that you're not ready. I want to notice the second thing in Luke chapter number 16, verse number 23 about death. You're going somewhere. Luke chapter number 16, verse number 23. The Bible said in verse number 22, And it came to pass, the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Notice the way the Bible says this now. It's clear. It delineates the difference between the death of the body and the existence of the soul. The Bible said in verse number 22, And was buried... There's the body. Verse 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Notice how the Bible says it. 
in hell he lift up his eyes. That's quite a thing. That's a descriptive term. That's the kind of thing that you ought to look at and think and take into your heart. He died. I don't know if he got sick and died. I don't know if he was struck down. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he's killed in an accident. But the Bible said the rich man died. It is inevitable. It's coming. He died. And they buried him. But they didn't bury him. They buried his body. For he's still around in the next verse. Notice how clear the scripture is in it. Even though they buried his body, the scripture says that in hell he lift up his eyes. He lift up his eyes. He took in where he was. It's the idea that after he body, his, his soul and spirit leaves his body, that he looks where he is. He looks around. He takes it in. And my, what a shock it must have been. My, what horror must have fled his soul. My, can you imagine how he must have felt? He might have been an atheist. He might have been an agnostic. He might have thought he was good. He might have been a self-righteous, religious person, regardless of what he was. The time came when he lift up his eyes. Do you understand the horror that's going to flood your soul? The moment you wake up in hell, when you realize that there's nothing around you but damnation and sorrow and burning in hell. Can you imagine what that'll be like? There's nobody to plead with. There's nobody to cry out to. There's nobody to go to to get help. You're in hell. To lift up your eyes in hell has got to be the worst shock that could possibly happen to anybody. Not dying. You're going to die. You'll prepare yourself, some of you, for that. You know you're going to leave here. That's not a shock. The shock is waking up where you don't expect to be. To think that when you die, you die like a dog and it's all over with. You bragged, you boasted, you've told people about how it. This is it. I'm just a dog. I'm just, a, I'm just an animal. And when my life is gone, just take me and bury me somewhere. It's all over with. I'm going to live life. This is it. One day at a time. And to find out how wrong you were. But it's too late. To realize that after all of your bragging, it's too late. That you are in a place that you can't do anything about. You don't have any idea of the horror that will flood your soul. That's what happened to this man. The Bible said he lift up his eyes in hell. My goodness gracious. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I don't want to go to hell. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to hell. And I'm not basing my future on you. The finest man that I ever knew in my life, the greatest Christian that I've ever met, I would not trust for one second with my soul. There's just one that I trust. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. I put my hope in Him, my future in Him, my faith in Him. What I am is in Him because He arose from the dead, glory to God. Our future is in Christ. It's all about the Son of God. It's not about a man. It's not about somebody's church. It's not about somebody's religion, system of ethics, whatever. It's in a man. And I've looked across the bar. I've been at a point in my life where I thought I might die. What'd you do, preacher? Did you think about your religion? I didn't give it five seconds. Amen. What about the people that you didn't even bother? What about this? I, none of it. Just the name of Jesus. I grabbed it. I latched on to the name of Jesus. That's the only comfort there is of this world. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you really take hold of him and he becomes a comfort to you, that reminds you and reassures you in your soul that you're a real believer. Yes! Did you hear what I said? When you're down and flat and it's out and you're out at the count, it's the one you're calling out to and take hold of and get comfort from. That's the one you believe in. Amen. Amen. Some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Your comfort is in a prayer you prayed. Your comfort is in a catechism that you were approved by. Your comfort is in your church. And there is no comfort in that hour but in one man. Christ Jesus the Lord and he does give comfort he does give comfort he does give assurance hell he lift up his eyes 
Earth's greatest, finest go to hell. Kings and queens and preachers and popes and nuns and evangelists, the very wealthy, the very poor, the gifted, the privileged, the authors, the musicians, the actors, the athletes, presidents, Supreme Court justices, dictators, murderers, thieves, atheists, agnostics, Christ rejectors all. That's who goes to hell. You don't go to hell because you're rich. You don't go to hell because you're poor. You don't go to hell because you're the president or because you're the Supreme Court justice, a king, or a pope. You don't go to hell for that. You go to hell when you reject Christ. That's why you go to hell. <laughs> There's no more debate. Nobody has to listen. I listened to an atheist the other day, and they said, he's a famous atheist. He wants you to know he's an atheist. He brags about it. His name's all over the Internet. Oh, and they ask him now, what happens when you die? Because you're going to die. You know, there's no more of this cross the leg, sit back, cameras, lights, and you're the big name, big shot. When it comes down to the end, it's the end. You're looking at death. What are you going to do if you're wrong and there's a God out there? You know what his answer was? Here's his answer. I'll have to paraphrase him. I don't have his words exactly. He says, I'm going to ask him which one he is. I'm going to ask him which God he is. And he named a few, Thor, Zeus, Baal, Mithras, Yahweh. I'm going to ask him. No, you won't. You're fooling yourself. Atheist, if you wake up in eternity and there's a God Almighty out there and you know you're approaching him, you're not going to bother asking anything. Here's what the Bible says about it. In Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse 31, it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's what it says. Your issue is not with preacher Lawson. You pick me to death. You tear me up. I'm just a man. I'm a mortal being. If you could make it between you and me, why you got, you got, you won already. You've already won. It's not about you and me. It's about you and this. It was here before you ever showed up. It'll be here when you're long gone. It was here before your school was ever built. It'll be here when your school is falling in ruins. This is the eternal word of the living God. The issue is not Preacher Lawson. The issue is God's word. What are you going to do with the book? If the Bible didn't exist, I might say, well, you know, every man does the best he can. Follow whatever light you got. If it feels good, do it. We go through life once and live it with gusto. You know, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But there's a Bible. If you were living in some pagan, dark country out here in the bush somewhere, couldn't read, didn't know zip, but you don't. You got a Bible right here in front of you. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about the book? What are you going to do? What are you going to do about the book? The atheist. Oh, they're arrogant today. They're in your face. The atheists atheist used to be the ones who, who crawled around in the darkness, you know, and they didn't want to. But today, it's, listen to me, let me tell you how what a fool you are for being a Christian. How intellectually deprived you are. How stupid you are to believe in God and to believe in the Bible and believe in eternity. Let me show you how smart I am. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're not very smart. Because there's not a man jack walking the face of this earth that can tell me what lies beyond the grave without the Bible. You don't know what's over there. Listen to this. Here's a man who's the son of a Methodist preacher. He was a good man, a good moral man, benevolent man. But he had one horrible fault. His heart was full of bitterness, and cursing. On several occasions, he went under deep conviction for salvation during revival meetings. Conviction is when you begin to quake because you hear the word of God, not here, but down here. God opens you up. That bothers sinners. When God opens you up, you know it's God because there's stuff he opens up to you that nobody knows about. Did you hear me? 
You can cover up your sin to your spouse, to your children, to your parents, to your friends. But buddy, when you go into a service and something opens you up, and I mean opens you up and says, I know everything about everything, and starts naming it, dates, times, places, that's conviction. Because he points you to Christ. He went through conviction, turned it off. A year later, another camp meeting held the same place, brought again under conviction, refused to yield. Listen to this. And three days later, he died suddenly. It's like J. Harold Smith when he preaches God's three deadlines. This man sinned away his day of grace. He was dead in three days. And by the way, they don't come any better than J. Harold Smith. God's three deadlines. Listen to this now if you don't hear anything else. I was with him in his last moments. He said, he seemed to be utterly forsaken of the Lord from the beginning of his sickness. The most powerful medicines had no effect on him whatsoever. Just as the sun of a beautiful Sabbath morning rose in its splendor over the eastern hills, he died in horrible agony. Listen. All through the night previous to his death, he suffered untold physical and mental torture. He offered to physicians all his earthly possessions if they would save his life. He was stubborn till the very last, would not acknowledge his fear of death till a few moments before he died. Then suddenly, he began to look, then to stare, horribly surprised and frightened into the vacancy before him. Then exclaimed as he beheld the king of terrors in all of his merciless wrath, My God! My God! Here is this unbeliever, Christ rejecter, who would say, I'll give you anything I got, Doc, if you'll, say, if you'll just give me a little more life. He's looking off into eternity and he says, My God! His eyes bulged out of his head. Popped out of its socket almost. And here's what they said. The indescribable expression of his countenance at this juncture, together with the despairing tones in which he uttered these last words, made every heart quake. His wife screamed and begged the brother to pray for him. But he was so terror-stricken he rushed out of the room. The dying man continued to stare in dreadful astonishment his mouth wide open, his eyes protruding out of their sockets till the last. And he fell over dead. Do you want to die like that? You say, people, the preacher, you're, you're an alarmist. You're playing on our emotions. You're just, you know, you, 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 you're trying to hype this thing to get me emotionally involved. No, I'm trying to reach you. You're jaded. What's that mean, preacher? You've seen so many deaths, seen so much violence on television, heard so much with your ears, that it's to the point now where it takes a, a sledgehammer to reach inside and get by all of that and get down to where you live and talk to you. And don't worry about this soul over here. Pray for him. In a few minutes, you may be down there next to them. I prayed before I got up here this morning, Holy Ghost, I'm the messenger, Lord, but this is your service. Some of these people may hear what they're hearing for the last time on this earth. This may be their last opportunity to ever make it right with God. And so he died. My God, he cried. The God that he wouldn't believe in, the God he wouldn't trust, the God he didn't believe was there. My God, he said. And his doctor couldn't help him, his wife couldn't help him, his friends couldn't help him, nobody in the room could help him, nobody could do a thing. And he died, he died. And he lift up his eyes. Now folks, listen to me. Your friends can go eat with you, your friends can go play with you, your family can gather around the table, you can talk, converse, socialize, do all you want to, everybody have all the friends, this, that, and so forth and so on. But when it comes to the time of crossing over from this world into eternity, you're gonna do it alone. You're going to do it alone. Are you ready for that? Let's talk about something else. It's called the cross. Jesus Christ, now listen carefully, did not die a horrible death on the cross for you to drive a new car. 
these godless prosperity preachers that spend all their time, all their time, godless as they can be, hear me and hear me well. There's only so much time left in this life, and you hear me well. All they talk about is money, 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 money. And they don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the cross, and salvation, and redemption, and the new birth. They know nothing about it. Where are they going, preacher? They're going to hell. They're going to hell, and they'll drag you down with them. I don't care if they're Pentecostal, Baptist, Lutheran, Episcopal. I don't care what they are. If all that preacher that you listen to talks about is money, what did Christ die for? They had money before he ever died. Long before he died. What did he die for then, preacher? He suffered the horror of the cross to keep you out of the horror of hell. The cross was horrible. Horrible. Horrible suffering. Unbelievable suffering. The reason it's so horrible is because hell is horrible. And the sacrifice of the Son of God was to keep you out of hell. I don't want to go to hell, preacher. I don't want to go. Well, I don't either. If you tell me this morning that you don't want to go to hell, you're showing me that you're still in your right mind. That you haven't been brainwashed and duped to the point now where you've bought into this lie where everybody's good and everybody's the same and everybody's going to go to heaven. No, they're not. No, they're not. Well, how do I stay out of hell, preacher? There's only one that can keep you out of hell. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That's what Peter said. But the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you cry out to him today? Why don't you accept him now? Why don't you say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to go to hell. Save me. The motive might not be all that pure, but who you're coming to is pure. Think about that. Don't ever let some religionist hang something over your head and tell you and try to analyze you and break you down spiritually as to why you prayed and this and that. Just remember this. If any man comes unto me, I will in no wise cast him out. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ today. You come to him this morning. You get up out of that seat and you say, I don't want to lift up my eyes in hell. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to come down to the end of my life and look off into a dark eternity and not have a clue what lies on the other side. And the closer I get to it, the greater the terror grows. And then when the moment of light, when the moment comes where I cross over, there's something over there waiting on me. Go ask these atheists what's on the other side. Yeah. I'll tell you something else to ask them. Ask them what life is. They don't have a clue. Yet they're so arrogant and so proud. And they know it all. And we're so stupid to believe in a creator. Yet they could not tell you what life means. They don't know what it is. Tell me what it is. What is life? Define it for me. Well, it's breathing. This, no, you're just talking about the life of the body. What's the life in the body when the life leaves? What is that? Define that for me. I can tell you what the Bible says. As the body without the spirit is dead... It is the spirit of life that comes from the life giver that's breathed into the body of an of a, of a, of a, of a organic thing and it comes to life. But there's a greater life than that. It is the very essence of God himself when he begets you as a son at the new birth. That cannot be taken away from you. That will never leave you. Once you've been born of the spirit, a million years from now, you'll still be born of the Spirit. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Oh, don't lift up your eye in hell. Don't lift up your eyes in hell. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And it's not about me. Not, don't do it for me. Do it for yourself. Don't lift up your eyes in hell. Because if you do, it's too late. It's too late. Are you ready? Are you ready? Remember, folks, I'm just a messenger. And that's the message that he laid on this messenger's heart two days ago, and I couldn't get it off. I couldn't get away from it. I couldn't change it. I couldn't do a thing about it. But get up here this morning and give it out to you. 
Now I feel a great burden lifted off of my soul. And I'll go home and I'll lay down tonight and I'll sleep and I'll thank him for my ticker. Ticking and ticking and ticking and ticking and ticking. I'll thank him for my food, for my house, for my clothes, my family. But I'll thank him that I know, that I know, that I know where I'm going when I leave this world. Father, in thy name we pray. Lord Jesus, I've said what you put on my heart to say. Somebody in this house this morning, somebody who saw this over the internet, somebody who'll see this later, somebody who'll see it on television, somebody who'll hear it on, a, hear it on the radio or hear it on a DVD or a CD, somebody can be born again from your holy word. That's your work. My part's over. That's what you do with your word now. And glorify it. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. What do we got, brother? Page 382 in your holiday. Won't you come? Won't you come? Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. Won't you come? Preparation for that day? Have you really? Have you? You know where you'll be six months from now? A year from now? Six days from now? Six minutes from now? Here's the biggest lie you ever heard in your life. This is the biggest lie you'll ever hear and live by. Well, it'll be like it was yesterday. It'll be like it was last week. Nothing. To, I've, I've heard the preacher, but nothing's really going to change. That's the reasoning of a fool. You don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. Are you ready? I'll sing another verse, brother. One other word I want to call your attention that's over there in Luke 16. When Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime. In thy lifetime. See, that word doesn't relate to God from everlasting to everlasting. But he said, In thy lifetime. You ever watch these old movies? See the movie stars, the people that lived just 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50. They're not here anymore. Many of them, they're just not here anymore. Why? Their lifetime ran its course. That's it. Their lifetime. I don't know if stuff like that affects you, but it does me. You have an appointed time. You have a space. You have, a, you have your time on this earth and then your time's up. That's it. It's up. It's over. 
You have no choice in the matter. And nothing you can do about it. Just like this man said, I'd give riches, I'd give everything I had. Can't. One famous atheist who was an Englishman, and of course England has no corner on atheism. We got plenty here and all around the world, but this famous atheist, he died about 30, 40 years ago. His death was about as dramatic as this one here because he's the one who said, uh, oh, I, you know, I'm dead, I'm dead, that's it. The old body just rots and that's all. What happened to you when you died? Just rot, that's it. That's not what happened when he died, though. They don't tell you that. I don't want you to know that. You ever notice how that they, they intentionally cover up certain things? He died screaming. 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 Oh, God. It's amazing that the atheists, when they come to their last breath, are calling on God. That's a remarkable thing. What's that tell you, folks? Don't buy their lie. Don't follow them. Ernest Hemingway put a 12-gauge shotgun in his mouth, pulled the trigger, and blew his brains out. He's one of the most famous atheists of all. That's what atheism leads to. No hope. No future. No hope. No future. I would encourage you to watch my website, The Lion of Judah. It's the church's website. The Lion of Judah. Log on and look right down below the screen at the top where there's a preaching. Look right below it where it says evolution versus God. Click on that and it'll take you straight to the video on YouTube and watch it. It's only 28 minutes long. Watch it. Listen to the agnostics and atheists as they show you what a fool they are. The man didn't make a fool out of them. They're already fools. All he did was reveal what a fool they were. Listen to them with their own words. Listen to him as he asks them questions and they just stump up. Never thought of that before. I think to myself, you ought to think of it because your soul is dependent upon it. So watch it. Would you do that, please? It's on the front page of the Lion of Judah, thelionofjudah.org. Tap that in. If you don't already have the URL, just tap that in. Do a Google and it'll pull you straight up. <laughs> it's 28 minutes long. It's on YouTube. Watch it. If you're on the fence and you're not sure, you're not certain, listen, these are professors we're talking about. These are, these are tenured professors, many of them. These are professors, folks. They're the teachers in the colleges and universities. Listen to them with their own words. Show you what a fool they are. Brother West, will you dismiss us?